Boom, we are live, ladies and gentlemen. I have a fantastic guest for you on the Arcane Bear channel today, Valentina Zarkova. She's a PhD in astrophysics. We're gonna be talking today about things like the grand solar minimum and some of our previous minimums like the Homer and the Maunder minimum as well. Valentina, tell us a little bit about your background and you know uh, how, how you, your interest in, in solar plasma physics and, and the studies that you're doing today and, and we'll lead into the paper. I uh, studied applied math and physics at the university and um, uh, at the end uh, when I did final year project I took um, a project which involves a lot of mass radiative transfer in uh, filamentary prominences and uh, this is how I became doing um, solar physics or plasma physics in solar plasma. So I've been working probably now maybe more than 30 years, so I'm not youngster exactly, but um, I spent a lot of time doing uh, different aspects, particle acceleration, solar flares, prominences. Um, we actually discovered, if you dig back the uh, news, uh, we discovered sunquakes in 1998 some of your readers probably were not even born at that time, but it was a big news uh, in all media channels because this was the first time the big news came from science to the all media. Now it become more um, acceptable, but we were the first who reported. So basically discovered that you, on, on the sun, you have some waves, like you have waves in the ocean, which propagate from the rock thrown to the, um, to the water. Similar, but we can detect them where is sun and where we are, we can detect them from here. So this was big mathematical exercise at that time. So then I was doing acceleration of very energetic particles and transporting solar flares. And then um, in 2002, we got the European grant European grid of solar observation. It was funding to do some general solar activity and automatically detect sunspot active regions on this solar disk. So to bring the top level mass automated recognition techniques into the uh, solar physics. So I was leading this recognition group and this is how we started. We created big data of sunspot and we thought with this data we can better predict average solar activity, which measured by average sunspot numbers. But despite we got a lot of information in sunspot, the prediction was not so improved. And there was um, then, we've we done this three years, large consortium, 10, 10 countries, uh, two from US and eight from Europe. And so that we had this database and we wanted to process it and understand it. So this from 2002, 2005, but this when I started working with general soil activity. And then we discovered that probably no sunspot, but background magnetic field has upper hand how and where sunspot appear. This is how we started working with background magnetic field, we published paper 2008, and then decided to classify it and find the own oscillations of the sun. Principal component analysis is basically eigenvalue solution, which is well known in um, solution of second order differential equations. It, this is exact problem. This is not artificial intelligence. This is exact problem. You have oscillations, so you can find um, wavelengths of these oscillations by finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So this is what, what we've done, the classic thing. And uh, what we discovered was a um, big surprise because we expected to have one principal component because all this um, prediction of solar activity comes with the one curve of the average sunspot number and one curve of the dynamo wave which should be generated inside the sun. But principal components show us two, two eigenvalues which are close in the magnitude close to each other. And we thought, oh, it looks like not a single wave, just two waves. So this is, was a big surprise, which took us a few years to digest 
and find um, any dynamo people who can explain why we have two ways while you say there will be one way. On, in the process, when we were investigating these curves, there were curves in numbers. So there were, you couldn't do anything with them because they were in numbers. So this one, we found the very nice method developed by Schmidt, Lipson, Lipson um, called Eureka Software, this, applying some intelligence, artificial intelligence, to classify these curves. What the guys claim, so if your curve is clean enough from any noise, they promise to give you analytical expression of your curve. So we thought, oh, this is what we need because we don't know how to uh, expand this curve further because it is not artificial intelligence method eigenvalue. We got it eigenvalue, we produce this vector, but we cannot expand it until we find some classification how how we describe this curve. So these guys were very helpful, uh, their software. And then this, we discovered uh, the analytical expression, approximately two product of cosine, uh, five product of cosine, series of five products of cosine, about five of those um, from whole series on the five terms were required, which can reproduce each of those curves. And they reproduce very nicely very, very accurately. So what told us that possibly we managed to separate this principal component, some particular uh, process. So what principal component acts as a prism on the white light, you know, optics, yeah, a yeah. little bit. So if you put a glass prism and put white light from one side, from another side, you have a nice uh, rainbow from UV to red all this rainbow. So your white light is split into the wavelengths. White light doesn't have any wavelengths. It is mixture of all. Similar is magnetic field, it's a mixture. It's white light. Okay. What we did, principal component acts as this prism. It allows you split my magnetic field into the components. So we took the top components, which were produced by dipole magnetic field north and south pole. And when you got this clean components without addition of any others, Eureka software manages to manage to find this analytical expression for them. It couldn't find for the whole magnetic field because it's so messy a lot, but could find for these two principal components. This is how we got the formula. Then we added these um, components together because all these people look on the one curve and we discovered that this summary curve, when you add these two components, actually is exactly what they call um, average sunspot number or solar activity index. We said, oh, bingo. It turned out that this magnetic field is a much better proxy than sunspot because it gives you the same uh, curve, the same solar activity index, but because we have so much more data, we have the whole solar disk of the data, the accuracy of our detection is much higher than you take tiny few 10, 20 sunspots on the whole area, which is a very small amount. So definitely it was a very interesting breakthrough when we realized this. So now you remember that we had expression analytically and we know that our summary curve represents the um, solar activity index. This is when we could calculate the summary curve back was 2000 year, 3000 and forward. And this is when we discovered this grand cycle, which comes every 400 years. So this is what came up. So th this is fascinating. I mean, just by what you're saying, you're, you've obviously been a, a leader and an innovator and, and a kind of a beacon of, of new ways to find out information of the sun. And the sun's such a powerful, force of, of our solar system, um, it's, it's 
and the fact that I mean, again, to just to, to clarify, so that I'm I'm understanding it clearly. We used to look at the the monitor minimums and the way we were looking at sun cycles just by defining the sunspots that we could count and we could v visibly see. And then the work that you did progressed our our understanding of the sun by looking at basically the waves on the on the top of the sun's sphere that aren't just that the sunspots aren't created by let's say, um, muck in the sun, they're actually created by interference of the magnetic waves um, over overlapping yeah. one another, essentially, is, is yeah. getting. So that this was a, a huge progression in understanding the way that the solar um, and the sun cycles represented themselves, because now we could look into the future and back into the past from, from this data that you had uh, created with this, this new, uh, I, I guess, the artificial breakdown. So one of the things I want to do is, is before we dive in, because again, this is such thick content. Um, I, I, when I grew up, I thought that the, the, the planets revolved around the sun and the elliptical. But as, as I started studying more of, of your work and, and other work around the, the solar system, I started to realize that the, the planets actually are, are almost behind the sun in a type of wake and that the sun is moving through interstellar space. So one of the things that's interesting to me about this, Valentina, is the fact that something that we know, like that, that you know so well in, in, in modern day science, I myself as, as a layman, it took, uh, I, I guess, my whole uh, almost 30 to 40 years, almost 30 years to come to the realization that the data that I had been given when I was younger was actually incorrect, that the sun, that the sun is at the front, uh, almost like a, an ice cream cone, and we, we roll a, around in its, in its wake. And that's why you see things like uh, Mercury in retrograde and why Mercury makes these beautiful um, positions. And this, so that you call this solar in, in inertia uh, momentum, or, or SIM for short. So can you tell us a little bit about how our, mo our movement through the, the universe behind the sun actually takes place? Uh, no, the solar inertial motion, it is not movement through the universe. It's a movement of the sun around the very center of the solar system. So Kepler laws were designed to say that all the planets move around the central star on the elliptical orbits. And this is absolutely correct, fine. But Kepler, it was simplified law. And in real life, it turned out that the planets actually, not every planet moves in the ecliptics. They have some inclination towards ecliptic, five plus minus five degrees, so they like wobbling. And uh, uh, the planets, not simple like soldiers follow Kepler law, planets remind that they have the mass. So the, they have very strong gravitational force. So on top of the Kepler laws, there are Newton gravitation law, which uh, allow the planets interacting with the sun and with each other. So what is happening because of this gravitation law, the planets move not around the sun itself, but around the body center of the whole solar system and make sun move also around body center, but not in the uh, round orbit like planets. But on this wobbly orbits, sometimes they're very stochastic, sometimes they're more orderly, depending where the planets are positioned on, the, on their orbital motion. And this was done first by Fairbridge and Shirley, American scientists in 1987. Jose was done 1965. And the, they, they were explaining this, they use JPL orbits and they, they basically what is presented in Jeff, JPL ephemeris about body center, they discovered this. So uh, no, no one pay attention. They, they discovered it and explained this, the sun is moving and they show and then Karvatova, the lady from Czech Republic, from Ongeo, I think astronomical institution, in 80s, 90s, she was um, uh, moving forward this idea of solar motion, but what was um, probably not accepted by people, why the people did not accept, they were trying to say that the whole dynamo is induced by planets inside the sun. And the people who calculate dynamo models, starting Eugene Parker in 1955 and later on, whole brilliant scientists, they recalculated and discovered, no, the planets cannot induce these uh, dynamo waves as they should. So 
this was a contradiction between why they didn't accept uh, solar inertial motion until recently it started working. So this is why the solar inertial motion is induced by planets and they always have, because they have different period rotations, so they could have one planet being this side, another from being this side, and the third planet could be uh, in the upper helium and another could be perihelium. So the, the sun moves more like uh, uh, regular, but then they move in an, one side, the sun is shifted towards them, then they move another side. This is what this is called the wobbling sun. Sun start wobbling around this body center. So all the planets move like uh, around the sun, but they make sun wobbling about this body center as well. This is what pay off uh, to gravitation law of Newton. So not only Kepler works, Kepler law works in solar system, but um, the uh, Newton law works as well. And this is well known in fact in uh, astrophysics because the astrophysicists detect exoplanet. They look on the, on the planets, which show this wobbling effect. On the stars, which show wobbling effect. As soon as they see wobbling effect of the star, they know it should be planetary system connected to it, and they start looking for the planets which could be exo ones. So this is uh, how, how it works. Um, beautiful. So, and what I what I like about this idea is that you know it shows that even though at one point we've had our particular thoughts about this the scientific thesis or, or the theory that we're using, but then as, as time moves, the science is almost always changing. Um, and that so let's let's dive back a little bit, I guess, into into this four hundred year cycle that you discovered through the um, the magnetic waves of the sun. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the previous, uh, uh, I guess, solar cycle minimums that we've gone through and the, and the maximums and, and how this, not the sunspots, but how the electromagnetic uh, energy of the sun, of, of, I guess, affects the, our, our, I guess, our solar system? What we need to know that normal solar cycle is um, 11 years when the magnetic uh, activity increases five and a half years and decreases five and a half years. And then if you want to keep the same polarity, so probably 22 years. So first it is increases in the Northern hemisphere. Northern hemisphere has North polarity, South and South. And then the swap polarity, South and become North and Northern become South. And when they return back to have the same polarity, it will be 22 years. So normal solar cycle 11 or 22 years, right? So this is the solar cycle we use. So when we have maximum solar activity, temperature on Earth slightly increases because of a lot of radiance, flares, and everything coming to the Earth. When we have minimum, no activity on the sun, temperature slightly decreases. Not much, but still decreases. What we discovered that these 11 year cycles actually are modulated. So the amplitude of these cycles are modulated with the envelope curve about 350, 400 years. Why it is modulated? Remember I told you they have, the sun has two waves. One wave is generated at the bottom of convection zone. Another wave is generated in this shallow region beneath the um, surface. So the way from the bottom needs to the travel through this other layer and two waves. And when the two waves are coming in contact, they start interfering with each other. And they have either coherent interference, uh, constructive. So if the phase is the same, the amplitude would increase very dramatically. But the waves, these two waves are actually off phase. So one wave slowly runs away from another. So the phase between the wave will be always changes. So one wave could have maximum, another have quarter of maximum. Then it moves, moves, and it has minimum at that time when the first wave has maximum. So it is off phase waves, right? So when the waves are off phase, completely, we 
have the destructive interference when the one wave cancels another. So because one have plus amplitude plus A, another wave has amplitude minus A. I add them into the um, summary curve, plus A minus A gives me zero. Yeah. So my amplitude becomes zero. So this is what happens during this grand minima. So the sun walks tirelessly. Sun even probably is not aware that what we see looks like grand minimum because it works very hard producing all these waves. And he doesn't understand why these people cannot understand it because it works steadily. But for us, it looks because this is destructive interference we don't see activity. And this is what happened. The closest ground minimum to us was Mount the Minimum, when there was a lot of absence of the activity for about six solar cycles. It was a long, long um, ground minimum. Before that, it was Wolf ground minimum. And then before it was Oort ground minimum, or it was ground minimum during the Roman Empire called Homeric ground minimum. So they do exist when we calculated back the scale we hit all these points which people reported at that time they didn't understand so what basically happening with this interference this effect when they cancel each other they call beating effect if you have a piano at home yeah and anyone comes to you call the uh, some some sound doesn't sound the right note not C or other. So you call guy, he comes with the fork and he needs to know either to increase the pressure of the string or decrease. So he puts sound with your button and kick the fork and they start sounding. And because they, they sound in slightly different frequencies, they will start producing beating effect and you hear these beats. Yeah, I, binaural. It, yeah, I, I give students exercises, they, beat, they hear three beats, how much pressure we need to add. This is what we do in class. So this is exactly happening on the sun. The difference in the frequency be this, between these two weights is just too small. So the, the uh, difference between this frequency is the frequency of this envelope wave. Right. which comes, uh, shows the hum amplitude will be increasing and decreasing in the grand minima. It's called so-called beating effect. So on the sun, we don't have engineer who can tune the sun. So this is why sun does the destructive interference. It let us to, un uh, you know, to understand it. You don't understand, it's a oh, oh, God. When they will learn, <laughs> the sun will ask. So to, um, just to, just to recap again too, because again this is such complex information that uh, so that we have two waves. One one's created almost from the center of the sun, and the, the secondary wave is appears to be coming from almost the cru the crust area. And then as so the, in, in the beneath the solar surface, the close uh, shallows layer beneath the solar surface. And then as these uh, waves interact, we have uh, cancellation effects, very similar to a binarial beat. So when the yeah. waves are actually lined up and they cancel one another out is when we, when we hit the lows in solar cycles because the, the cancellation of the waves is when there's no, there's no sunspots because we don't have that, uh, the agitation of the, the magnetics uh, interacting with one another. Yes, so because in, they were canceling each other, yeah. And, and yes. so you, your team was the first to find the, the reason for that 400 year cycle that we, when we look back, because in the, in the, Roman, the Roman time, we'll use the, the Homeric uh, minimum as, as an example. These are times when we see uh, food production and growth or, I sorry, the growth of food is very difficult. And we also see generally a decline right. in um, the empires around those areas as well, because it's that much more difficult to produce food. So okay. one of the things that, that you're, you're interested in and, and, and that you started Bring this up is because when we get close to the minimums, it's it's that much harder produ to produce food because of the lack of solar um, variations, which is actually seems to be beneficial not just for our magnetosphere, which is one of the things that protects us, but also from um, the the extra uh, let's call it solar uh, is I, is it solar 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 irradiance like how much energy is coming into the planet at any given moment. Um, so my, my part of my question here is. We're about to head into a, a new grand solar cycle 
it, can we take any type of conclusion of what that might be like as in comparison with some of the previous recent uh, cycles we had seen, like the Homer or the, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, um, the, or the orc ones, the other, other areas of our civilization and how it affected us? Yeah, it, luckily for us, this uh, grand minimum, which is upcoming from 2020, 2053, will be less long than Mount the Minimum, twice shorter. It will be only three solar cycles, 25, 26, and 27. So it is much shorter. And because the temperature sun is closer to the Earth since Mount the Minimum, because it's moving toward the Earth next thousand years, and it already made journey for about 400 uh, years. So the temperature already slightly increased on the Earth. So the drop of the temperature will override this increase. So it will not be that dramatic as it was in Mount the Minimum. So we will not be that much affected that for 60 years, there will not be growing anything and people will be struggling or fr frozen and everything. But we don't know what will be because what happened that time, we had little information. We can only assume by looking what people investigated, like Lynn et al, they uh, produced the irradiance of the uh, sun during Mount the Minimum, which irradiance itself dropped only three, three uh, tenths of percent. So it was not that much, but mainly because the reduction of magnetic field reduced a lot of things in, on the Earth. So this is what uh, affects. So it will not be that bad, but it still will be bad because what you see now, I don't know if you heard, there was snow on the 7th, 12th, and 14th of July in Carpathian Mountains in Romania and Ukraine in July never been 150 years, they never seen snow. And uh, there were hailstones in Mexico. Remember, there was on the news two, two meters of hailstones. Literally, they had snow in the middle of summer in Mexico. Yeah. It, it was uh, well, the Hura, I think, city. Or it was hailstones during the recent, two weeks ago, a week ago, it was Tour de France. They couldn't pass... The, the mountain road because hailstone was so strong, it was like a slide of the, of the earth moved down. So th this is what happened in July yeah. now, and we just approaching towards the ground minimum. So the worst uh, will be in the cycle 26, between cycle 25 and 27, because this is where the waves cancel each other. So the activity drops very dramatically. So in, 2030, 2040, they will be the worst. So we have about 10, 11 years to prepare ourselves for this. And many uh, smart people, they actually take an action. They, you know, that the, uh, the, ground, the soil or fields in Africa are now actively bought by uh, Chinese people. They know they will yeah. be feeding Europe from Africa. This is the only part which will be able to produce things. So there's some people do understand and listen what they say. So, but we will be seeing this for the first time with the whole instruments, we will be observing and understanding what, what, what it is. At the moment, we have only description of medieval people. Yeah. And only guesses how it is acting. Um, okay, so so this is this is part of the conversation I think that becomes contentious for listeners on either side of the spectrum because essentially, and again, I'll try to I'll try to break it down so that I'm clarifying and make sure I understand each each of these pieces because we now know that the uh, the magnetic waves of the sun are are the the actual root cause of the um, sunspots and we now have uh, your I mean your your team's credited for finding this cycle on a larger scale, which proves the, um, the, monitor, uh, you know, the other minimums which we had seen previously, and also line up with the decline of many civilizations that we've seen in our past around that 400 year cycle. The, this comes into almost direct contradiction to the IPCC models, which say we're going to be heating quite rapidly 
Um, now, again, my, my main interest here is to try to not take a position and just try to uh, as be as inquisitive as possible, even though I actually already have my own formula, formulated opinion. I've had that for quite uh, a bunch of years. The scientific data that you're presenting here how is it received by um, the the climate uh, scientists? Because again, you're saying, and I agree with you. I mean, we I saw snow here in Costa Rica this year, um, up in up at around 5,600 feet, and that's unheard of. Um, and and I I had actually had dreams of it snowing in Costa Rica when I first moved here five years ago. And these are abstract things to to think about, right? Because you would never suspect that you would see snow. Uh, around the uh, the equator, it's it's mm -hmm. very un un unlikely, especially when the IPCC is saying that our our temperatures are actually in increasing. So uh, I'm really interested here because this is such uh, your your data has been scientifically backed up. You have uh, peer reviewed papers written on uh, Nature.com, which is one of the most prestigious uh, peer reviewed journals on the planet, um, and you have. Uh, countless PhDs, as far as I can tell, that are, are, are um, so, uh, basic, basically in support of your side of the conversation. Can you tell us what it's been like to have uh, contradictory data, in, which should, in my particular understanding, should be heralded by the scientific community because we're here to try to disprove ourselves, not prove ourselves. Can you tell us what it's been like to, to, to I guess, dis discover this new information because it is in direct contradiction with what the IPCC is saying? Well, yeah, IPCC probably they they have um, very uh, narrow-minded inclination to prove that everything be done done by human beings that we are powerful, we are eating ourselves out, <laughs> we are poisoning ourselves with the <laughs> with the carbon di dioxide. Despite when we had dinosaurs. The carbon dioxide produced by dinosaurs were much higher than by our cows, and the planet was flourishing, having a few jungles and everything. So there's some contradiction in this one. I don't want to get into the details because, um, as far as I r remember, IPCC didn't include much effect of the solar activity. They, they considered everything but solar activity. So. This is why we are going like in parallel directions with them. And what I'm saying that we have not so long to wait to see who is right. right. They're saying it will not be cold. And I'm saying, no, it will be cold. And I'm confident I'm right because I'm using the data which Sun shown to me. Sun shown to me, <laughs> the, me and my colleagues, the data and many other scientists who are not directly involved, who were not paid for calculating solar indexes and counting sunspot and so on, who are afraid to lose their job because voila, some group explained the solar activity and what shall we do with these sunspots? We keep counting them for 40 years and suddenly, so what, we don't do this? No, we still need to do this. We don't understand many details. And the, the same IPCC, if they would embrace our model, their model would become much more powerful because it would be able to explain the terrestrial temperature during the great grand solar minimum. At the moment, they cannot get temperature to drop to the level where it was in Mount the Minimum. This is why they say, oh, it never happened. It was only once cold and it was not. So this is because the model doesn't work, they re reject the reality. So I think the sun eventually fed up with this and decided to show who is the boss <laughs> and put the grand minimum straight in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what, and we are only the messengers. I, I, I know they don't like us, the messengers, but we are not the one who doing the things. This guy who is uh, yellow on the sky, this is guy is doing it. And we just only explaining what he's doing. And we will see this in a few five years time, for sure, five, maximum 10 years, but it will start m moving even next few years. We, we see now it is much colder. I don't know about what Costa Rica, but in the UK, my heating was on until 28th of June, which never happened before. 
I lived 30 years in the UK. I never put heat in since April, no, in normal years. But last two years, we need to put this heat in on. So this was definitely temperature is decreasing. And uh, we will see, we will see, uh, observe from the front row, everyone will observe who is right, yeah. us or IPCC. Yeah, and this is one of the fascinating parts about this conversation, because for me as a layman, the answer, the sun being the answer is the simple, is the simple, it's like the Occam's razor choice of what's actually going on here. Why has, um, why, I mean, there, we see that there's changes on other planets, their, their magnetosphere, their, their temperatures are changing as well. So our, our influence on the planet has nothing to do with these other planets, yet the sun is able to throw the rest of our solar system into, into a change. And it's one of these interesting topics where we've seen so many times in history where when the mainstream is, is touting, uh, uh, touting a, like a scientific line, they've often been, been wrong. And it's the few who are going against that line that, that end up being right. So we've seen this has happened many times before in our scientific history. And it's, one of the, it's almost one of these befuddling ideas because science is, is not supposed to try to find out who's right, it's supposed to try to prove itself wrong. And if it can't do that, then it says, hey, we've come to a conclusion that this is probably true because we can't disprove it. Whereas Absolutely. nowadays, a lot of people that are studying, they're trying to prove their models and, and you end up with a, a, a constant ep echo chamber and, and a feedback loop to, to now prove what you're saying in, in the scientific world. Uh, it's just, it's almost befuddling to me to, to, to see. So, um, exactly, you, you hit the problem into the nail to the head straight forward. It reminds me medieval time when they had Ptolemy system. You know, theoreticians, they can always find the model which can feed observations with different aspects. You can add this or that. So when they have Ptolemy model, when the sun and planets rotate around the earth, they invented specific orbits of the planet which they move in different spheres, jumping from one to another, in order to match the movement on the sky observed from the Earth. And they succeeded. They put it on. When Copernicus came up with the, geos with the uh, solar system with the sun in the center, they said, no, it is not. We have all the model. Everything is approved. This is jumping from sphere to sphere. While Copernicus model uh, developed also by Kepler, it is much more simpler. So the real model has to be simple, straightforward. <laughs> then it is, should be correct. Because when you start putting a lot of different stop onto the model, it gives a good sign that probably it is not correct because you need too many complications in that. Why the planets would move from one, one sphere to another to, to move. This is what, it took about 20 years until Copernicus model came through and Kepler came up with this, his Kepler laws when they started progressing. But the mainstream of the scientists did not accept it for another probably 50 years because uh, they were told yeah. for, for, for centuries this model. So this is the thing which, which I do understand. I do understand I only, I, did not expect that in 21st century our scientists will behave like medieval ones. This is yeah. what uh, amuses me most. I thought we, we develop our brains, we increase the knowledge, and we provided a much wider spectrum of um, opinion so we can accept and try to understand something else. So this is what um, a bit surprising. Yeah, just uh, I'll, I'll I'll veer off topic just here for a second to to give more backup to this. One of my one of the scientists that I've really been enjoying following lately is a, is a man named Dr. Robert Schock, who's a geologist, and he's been studying uh, the Younger Dryas period and, and the cataclysmic events that seem to have taken place some twelve thousand years ago. Um, and he was doing research on the Sphinx when he first got there, and there's all this um, geological evidence that it was. Uh, water that had actually eroded around the edges. And the only time that we would have had water around the Sphinx was some 12,000 years ago. And he's been consistently, uh, you know, there's been more and more evidence that's mounting to prove 
uh, or I guess that, that can't disprove his theory. But what he what he mentioned is is he thinks that because so many people have invested their lives and their PhDs into something that might actually be wrong, you're not you're not just fighting you're fighting people's deep seated beliefs and their investment into not not only who they think they are but who they've taught now exactly. to. Very correct, exactly. So they don't want to give up. They got all the funding. They got built all the community papers and everything, and now they need to give them up. This is why it's difficult to move on. Yeah. And uh, I think only when snow started falling in Costa Rica in July in 2030, 2035, they have no choice. Maybe they invent something. They're still saying that uh, this huge rains and cold is because of global warming. They keep still saying this. <laughs> So here's here's an here's an interesting abstract, and I know that your your field doesn't necessarily lean over into this area, but um, there's I have some really interesting uh, questions. I don't know how to formulate them here, so you'll have to um, bear with me for a second. But okay, so we're, we're taking into account now we're looking at the sun and that the fact that now that the sun's um, uh, the, the dynamo relationships between these waves is about to come into a space where they're canceling out. And this decreases the electromagnetics of the sun and its influence on our planet specifically. Well, let's use the sun and our planet as the two that we're looking at. How much of our magnetosphere around the planet is actually created by the sun? If we were to lose the sun, would we have the protective ionosphere and magnetosphere that we have around our planet today? Luckily we do because it's, provided by our own magnetic field on the earth. What happened, the sun produces this magnetic field for the whole solar system. It expands this so-called heliospheric current sheet, magnetic field coming from the sun. And this magnetic field protects the whole solar system from harming cosmic rays coming from other uh, galaxies and other. So this magnetic field is our shield which protects the whole solar system from any strangers coming up. So the sun magnetic field turns them around, go away, go away. So we don't have harm, harmful radiation. What happened when the magnetic field reduced, right? And reduced very dramatically. So it doesn't help anymore it, it also suppresses the magnetic field of the planets because it keeps them like in order, in bay. And then suddenly this magnetic field starts reducing. So what's happening, that the magnetic field of the planets take over. They become now stronger than the magnetic field of the sun. This is why during the Grand Minima, they have all these sun quakes, eruption of volcanoes, and all these uh, um, catastrophic events because our magnetic field doesn't have any suppression anymore, and this is not acting you know, like without supervision. This is what my understanding is. Plus, again, if magnetic field is gone, it means that we have more cosmic rays coming towards us. And it was um, uh, the whole group of um, Hendrik Svenbach from the Danish Academy, they, they actually calculated that reduction of solar magnetic field increases the formation of clouds, and this is why the cooling happening. So they basically wow. produce the mechanism how this reduction of magnetic field cool uh, leads to the cooling on the Earth, because we don't explain how, how it happened on the Earth. We stop at the sun, we say magnetic field is reduced and leave it to the climatologists and the earth to explain it. And people explain how this happens. So he, he, he probably last 10 years developing it in the, uh, very complementary to what we say. He says the sun has to be main source. He doesn't explain how the sun has to be main source, but he, what we deliver to him is a input to his model and then he produces this. So, this is how um, the reduction of the solar magnetic field affects the planets. So it will not affect on the Earth, it will affect other planets as well. By the way, the, there are um, typhoons in Jupiter, which never been before, very often ob observe typhoons 
if you see these small circles, if people observe Jupiter, plus um, the polar caps of Mars are melting as well, not only Earth. So obviously at, at that time it was happening simultaneously. So whatever happening with the sun, each, each planet has a, a feedback. They, they follow what the sun does. So, so we see more evidence to this now with, um, so we're currently ent entering these minimum cycles. So we've actually seen a large decrease in sunspots over the, over the last year from, from the study that I've done. And we've yeah. actually seen an increase in solar flares, which is, or sorry, not solar flares, but um, uh, aurora borealis, which is normally only yeah. seen when we get a solar flare. So we can see a, like a direct visual correlation to, um, the, the, even though, because normally when we see uh, aurora borealis, it comes from a solar flare. But if there's no solar flares, yet we're still seeing the aurora borealis, and maybe on a, a even on a heightened level than normal, we know that we're exposed to a lot more radiation and electro cosmic rays. We yeah. have much stronger cosmic rays, which call this aurora because cosmic rays they're the same energetic particles. Previously, yeah. sun protected us; they couldn't reach the earth. Wow! Now, sun magnetic field is gone. And they drop in on the earth and producing it. By the way, during the spur minimum, it was an explosion of supernova about 600 um, light years near the solar system. Okay. And uh, this produced very strong cosmic rays. And it, this was um, why when they calculated uh, the solar irradiance based on carbon dating and use normal background, they found that it should be minimum, while in reality, the background was so strong mm. that it consumed the maximum. So the effect of supernovas on the life and the solar system would be very dramatic. If any supernova explodes near 500 uh, light years towards us, the Earth and solar system will be dead. They will be completely burned out by this uh, cosmic rays. Okay. Like recent supernovas are exploding somewhere else, but these are still energetic particles which come in. And when the sun takes off its shield, this is why we have these particles dropping in, causing this um, aurora borealis. So nothing surprising. Yeah. So, the, I mean, there's a, a fascinating, I know a lot of the people that are fans of the Bear family are, are, are fans of a uh, gentleman named Cliff High. And I won't, I won't digress into his work too much, but he, for the last few years, has been saying that um, we're, one, of the, one of the most interesting parts about the time that we're moving into is the way that these cosmic rays actually end up affecting pe people, because we don't necessarily know what all this extra um, radiation and, and basically very highly charged vibrations due to the, the human body or the, the psyche at large because we don't know and we, when we know that we see okay if there's a decrease in food we see rapid declines in the civilizations around these monitor or these minimum times we might be able to I mean at least loosely correlate the fact that it might not just be um, the lack of food that is part of the decline of these civilizations but it might actually in some way shape or form be uh, the exposure to all this extra radiation that makes people erratic or act um, maybe more crazy than they, they normally would because the human body is such a sensitive antenna. Um, I don't want to dive into that too much, but one of the things that you brought up there that, that's fascinated me, um, okay, so I've been doing a lot of research into the Younger Dryas period because I, I'm interested of, well, you know, about the, the potential other civilizations that might may have been here that couldn't have withstood whatever cataclysm we went through because they seem to be fairly uh, highly advanced. Um, I, and, you know, a lot of scientists think that we were actually hit by um, an asteroid, and that's the prevailing theory today. Uh, and, and one of my questions is, is kind of about the supernova. If other stars are able to, to have a nova-like effect uh, or expression, it, what's the likelihood of our sun having a, a, a supernova event or even a mi like a minor nova? Yeah, luckily for us, the sun will not hopefully reach this status for another four and a half billion years. It's okay. been supernova four and a half um, billion before it, uh, after it uh, formed. But uh, for in this current status and the white dwarf, uh, it will live for another 
another four and a half billion years. So there's no harm for us from sun, but there still could be harm from, from other supernovas. As I said, uh, one supernova definitely affected uh, the earth. If you were interested in this, you look at the supernova happened in 1280 in the southern, very southern part of the sky. And this caused a strong, what supernova, when you have these uh, particles coming, they wake up the very big um, viruses and everything, which caused uh, lots of disease in uh, southern parts in Mexico, in China, and then eventually to the 14th century, this um, Black Death and other, they came to Europe. So this is actually the explosion of supernova and this huge cosmic radiation started like really dying civilization. So it was not grand minimum, it was something else outside our control. What was in uh, was 13, 14th century, which caused uh, this uh, change of the dynasty in Chinese um, uh, kingdom. So because they thought the gods are against him, but it was not gods, it was just supernova and so on. So this is uh, not that simple. So not everything in our hands. We are lucky that we live in the limits when the planet can exist <laughs> and the sun gives enough radiation to survive. We are coming now through a little bit more difficult time, but the sun will not provide. But this is the tiny thing compared what else could be done. If you look um, at so-called Milankovitch cycles, we have different, um, like, uh, oscillations of the orbit. So the, the Earth is inclined to the uh, ecliptics. At the moment, it's 23 degree, but it could vary from 24 to 22. And depending where it is inclined, we can have either cold, colder or warmer. And the period of this uh, variation uh, obliquity is about 40,000 years. Plus there will be a precession of the orbit for 100,000 years, which exactly coincides with the real ice period, with this 100,000 years ice period, which were observed when the Earth, everything was completely frozen out on the Earth. So there are a lot of effects which come in from the orbital motion of the sun, of the planet, and the whole solar system around the galaxy, which comes out. So this is what we need to keep in mind. And if we claim that we are so strong, <coughs> to affect the temperature of the Earth, I think it's the challenging the gods. I, I am really scared when people say so, because like you, I respect the great civilization of Khmers or, or Egyptians. They, they built such a grandiose uh, building and then suddenly disappeared. Yeah. Suddenly disappeared from nowhere. So there's something when people become arrogant and do not pay attention to, to the gods and to the reality, they pay the price. So this is what what happens? Yeah, one of those one of those abstract moments where we become entirely too comfortable and entirely too cocky with how chaotic the universe can create the uh, can actually shape the environment that we live in. Um, I, I'll do more research into the soap, the supernova of twelve eighteen. Um, the, one of the questions I wanted to, to lean into here as well is that there is an article produced on Nature.com about the change in the well, or I guess the increase in the speed of the North Pole moving. Is there? Do you think that there's any underlying relationship between again the the, the sun's magnetic effect and the, the current position and the, the seemingly uh, uh, increasing speed of the movement of the North Pole in our magnetosphere? Yeah, my opinion here, like uh, layman opinion, because I did investigate the no motion of the North, of the Pole on the Earth, but it's very plausible. When the magnetic field which suppresses or makes an order in the whole solar system is reduced, the magnetic field of the each component of the solar system probably start acting on their own. And the people who do investigation in the Earth 
magnetic field, they, they say that it periodically changes the polarity. So obviously, this magnetic pole has to move somehow, similar like uh, solar uh, magnetic pole, they, they change in polarity every 11 years, north and south. On the Earth, luckily, it is much uh, longer, uh, I think 100,000 years or something, but it's still happening. So we cannot deny it. This is the fact. And maybe reduction of magnetic field allows the magnetic field of the planet to take over and do whatever they want to do. Maybe when magnetic field was stronger, it kept the pole at its uh, position where it should be. When it is gone, the pole start moving elsewhere. Yeah. This, but they start wandering. So part of the question, I guess, to, to uh, extrapolate on that is, do we have any evidence of the solar uh, inertia affecting the planets individually as well, so that, that we, we see that there might be uh, almost like a, I, I, I'll share some of the graphs that you've, uh, on your Nature article, and everyone, the, the article that uh, Valentina and her team produced will be, will be in the links below. But do you think that um, our, our, I guess, central, uh, magnetosphere is affected by the other planets the same way this, the sun is and you have a, a, a an almost a minimal like a kind of a a, a pulling and pulling or a pushing and pulling which could again be one of the ideas of, of why we have a, a wandering north pole at the more at the moment yes no one investigated as i said at the moment they excluded all these larger planets so we need to include them in calculation ephemery and see what happens I assume they should be. If these planets affect the sun, they should somehow affect other planets. Definitely, the sun motion, increase of the temperature will be not only on Earth. It will be on every planet. Simply, every planet probably ha have larger uh, radius of the eclipse. So, so the uh, increase will be less sensitive. Probably more sensitive for Mercury, which is closer to the sun but less uh, sensitive for the larger planets which move in on larger orbits. So this is what uh, the, each planet will feel, this uh, solar inertia motion, but um, how exactly it needs to be calculated. Uh, br uh, brilliant. This is absolutely uh, fascinating stuff to me. I really had, a, I have had a great time the last two weeks and it's taken me at least that much time to go through your paper to digest some of it because this is, these are, this is far from uh, layman's understanding. Again, just for me, even, even taking in the, I guess, a new version of the solar system took a fair amount of like, I'll say meditation or like a uh, re-understanding of, of our place in, in the universe. Um, I, I guess I'll dive in back to some of the previous stuff that you'd gone over because when you first started presenting this, you also had a, not an alarm but a, to, a tonality of the the necessity for our our I guess our planet or our governments to not not be focusing on the temperatures going up, but actually what we should be doing when the temperatures go down to make sure that we can produce enough food for people. Um, it, are you still sharing information about? Uh, or, or have you kind of veered away from, uh, I guess, directly trying to com combat the, the opposing field line and just share your data now and let those who can hear, hear? <laughs> we tried, um, we were speaking to those people who support this idea of Grand Solar Minimum. We realized this is the real danger. You look at the historical data backwards uh, when the life is difficult this time. So we was thinking to arrange a meeting like um, uh, and try to bring attention to the government that maybe carbon dioxide is dangerous and everything, but we need to take a break for the next 30 years because we have more impending danger when the temperature drops and we will not have enough vegetation time for vegetables, for fruits to grow up because snow will be until probably May and they will, will not be growing up. So this is what needs to be tackled. But um, we, we're still thinking about it. Uh, again, um, I didn't expect that response to my recent paper will be so dramatic. We didn't realize that those people who do IPCC, they didn't read 
the papers about SIM, it came to them as a complete surprise. So it was educational for them. So we were slightly we rooted attention fighting with, with these people instead of raising awareness that we need to reunite the governments to at least of the Northern America and Northern Europe countries to, to, to think about it. It's not necessarily we need to do anything now, but we need to think where, where we get this food, where, where, where it comes from, when it starts snowing, when we have snow lying until June, and to grow potato, you have to have put potato somewhere in April, it grows only in uh, July, but if you put potato in beginning of July, it will not have time and snow start coming back in August. There's no enough time to grow up the potato, so where we will grow up potato? So maybe we need to build greenhouses indeed, real greenhouses to, to produce them, or we need to put um, relationship with African countries and establish kind of um, exchange. We, we do something for them and they do something for us. And the same from uh, America, maybe will be time in 10 years when Mexicans say, we do not accept any more Americans. This <laughs> absolutely dreadful people let them live in this cold thing where we, we don't have enough room and food for them so this would they have to be nice to each other yeah. they need to learn to live together because there might be a situation will swap like this very quickly you, you know Val valentina it's it's such a pleasure to to hear your your side of the story too and before we jumped on you, you were talking about how some of the scientists who are, who are focused in, in these areas, because um, the you know, solar solar plasma, uh, solar plasma um, astrophysics is not it's not generally included in in their cli these climate conversations, um, and to be hit with so much um, uh, I guess negative feedback in in the scientific world is such a telling sign that that they're going down the wrong direction because the scientific community is supposed to embrace those that have contradictory viewpoints and actually try to discover further, especially when you have so many uh, PhDs that are like, yep, this is correct. <laughs> this is, we found, we, you know, this is, this is not, there's no debate about your, um, the, the solar cycles that you guys have found with your models here. Um, did, did you expect the, this type of, I guess, um, like bullhorn feedback, or did you thought? Did you think that when you, when you first, because you because you've discovered this stuff, and again, it's only the information that's the, you know the sun and the data is giving you. Did you think that you would hit such um, a highly charged, let's say, like I don't even know what to call, like almost like a religious wall? <laughs> no, I didn't expect it. But then later, what I realized, I organized the introductory school for. Uh, solar physics, solar terrestrial physics students. We organize each institution once per 10 year organizes for the whole community. And then I invited these guys who work uh, on the IPCC models from meteor office and so on to give the talk. So I'm quite open minded. I'm happy to listen what they have to say. And they were saying there will be temperature increase, and I said no, it will. <laughs> I needed to to reject. I said no, it will be decreasing. And uh, but while we were having then coffee and very civilized conversation, I respect people. I suspect they have some reason. I realized they they told us they have funding uh, for twenty six postdocs versus. The whole UK Solar Terrestrial Council funds on the 22 for the whole UK. So it gives you indication. They have very strong uh, motivation to protect what they do because they got drug all the funding to themselves. They need to verify this funding. And suddenly comes up someone like us who, who didn't know all of it. We just did completely out of curiosity because we were not even paid for it. It was done between different jobs, between everything. And then we discovered this. They, they tried to protect their funding. The main thing, 
maybe they do understand them, maybe I'm correct, but they now need to explain what happened, why they missed this. So, and uh, I understand, I'm very sympathetic to the ideas, but the sun has its own agenda and we have to respect our big bright star and follow what it says. So with all understanding, we have to be truthful. And so you, I, and I don't, I don't want to dive into this too much, but again, this is part of the, uh, the, the area of the conversation that's interesting to me is basically the, the, the human psyche um, and the way we kind of try to combat uh, beliefs. You know, the, the world of re religiosity is one of the, a, a great example of how we can uh, just forci forcibly try to change the world by just what we believe with no data <laughs> at all. Um, you had mentioned that there were a bunch of other uh, um, physicists that uh, had gone to the Kyoto, the Kyoto Accord and the Paris Agreements to to try to present this data, and and that that there was a yeah there that there was this pushback as well. What about the the other scientists um, that work in this field? How how have they been reacting to the well, a number of scientists who do support it, and we work with them. We shared the data with some they, uh, scientists from Austria, from America from high altitude observatories. So the, who, those who have interest and have sincere wish to work with the data, we are more than happy to work with people. We, moreover, we now planning to check, to run the similar analysis on the data from a few different observatories taken from different parts of the earth to prove that we get the similar eigenvalues, the similar eigenvectors, they're not dependent uh, on which part of Earth you observe because they come from the sun, they should be independent. So this is what we will be doing. So uh, I fully understand and happy to answer uh, any objections as soon as we have any funding. Unlike them, I didn't have a single Penny uh, working for this. It was only out of curiosity all these four co-authors doing in spare time. And uh, it took me a half year to uh, explain uh, this uh, few section about solar national motion. I needed to learn. I needed to read the papers and to digest myself to understand how it happened because it was new for me. It took me six months to read it, write one version, then another and then another to understand logics of it. So this is the brand new thing. So if we get funded, um, we, at the moment we have a great support for many people with the nations. You know, it is really amazing. I'm really grateful to many people who support us. They, they simply want us to do this research. So it's great, but also there's some uh, funding bodies who now want to fund us. So maybe, if we get support, we start doing this and persuading the community and especially scientific community that it is the right way to move and it is no danger for them being dangerous because the research what they've done is extremely helpful because we will benchmark our research by there. So there's no danger for them losing funding or something. So this is what I would say. Um, again, we need to learn to live in compromises yeah well i i um like i said i, I try not, i'm going to try not to have an opinion but i i believe i believe this as you've said we're going to know very very soon uh what's going to happen because we're going to see those changes and effects come into play within the next few years within the next five years it should be noticeable that it's getting yeah. cooler around the planet um i we actually had a, a thomas campbell on the show last year who's a phd i don't know if you know any of his work uh he does um he does some really abstract stuff in, in the in the world of physics, and I know he had ran a GoFundMe page to do some e for extra funding to try to do uh, redo variations of the double split test to try to prove that there is an actual relationship between the, our conscious observation of the experiments that are taking place. And anyways, it's it's fascinating stuff. And and they were to raise some money. Um, I know you know I first heard of you your name through Cliff. Through Cliff High, and that's what uh, sparked my interest in, in your research because it was put a name to someone actually doing the the solar research. Um, and through you know through again the last two, uh, week or two, I've been diving into some of your previous podcasts, and I know that the uh, the Grand Solar Minimum Channel 
um, had produced a GoFundMe for, page for you. So what yeah. I'll do is they I'll try to find fantastic. Them. Yeah, they did wow. produce for me. Beautiful. So I'll, I'll find those links for any of you that are interested in helping fund uh, Valentina's work and the other scientists that are in this field. Uh, we'll leave that GoFundMe page down at the bottom. Again, because what we're battling here is uh, what appears to be, um, let's say, a, a p political uh, agenda, or at least wherever the funding is coming from is what's getting the focus. And it's, it's acting as an echo chamber. So if we have to do crowdsourced funding for scientific data, I think this is likely going to become one of the waves of the future because, I mean, you know, people like Joe Rogan uh, and have brought, brought these counterculture scientific debates to the, not to the mainstream, but at least to a much larger audience than it had ever gotten before. And I think there's a lot of people that are starting to ask questions ab about the, these particular topics and, and come, you know, coming to maybe the same conclusion that I've come to, which is, is it just the sun? Like it's such a simple answer and it may very well be the truth. So Valentina, I really, really appreciate all the hard work that you and your team have put into this. Again, by, you know, doing it out of, out of your own curiosity and, and your own love for scientific research and, and coming up against the, the wall in the face of almost, uh, I guess, what could be considered Goliath collaborations for uh, pro producing particular types of scientific outcomes. I, I commend you for that. And I also really appreciate um, the, I'm, I don't want to uh, uh, almost childlike reception for you to be, because you went, you, again, you went at it just looking for, at the data. So to receive such a, uh, an unwelcomed response from the other communities, I'm sure was uh, not necessarily, you'd be like, like, Hey, look at this cool data I've found. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is what we felt like children. Oh, we found, discovered, everyone will be happy. Oh, why they not happy? <laughs> this is but, but I'm really grateful to many people and grateful that we live in different era, that we can go fund me and do it. And we have blogs, we have internet, we can know your opinion to many people uh, outside the, the, the all these journals. Because previously in 17th century, if someone doesn't want you to do, they will not publish you. They will not allow you to, to appear and you go on nowhere. Yeah. No, this, well, now my talks are viewed by 90,000 people or 100,000 people. So the, the word is spread to people, it sits on their knowledge and they, they start questioning. They start questioning politicians, they start questioning other people. So the accumulative mind of humankind start walking in the right direction. This is what I hope we are trying to encourage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for, for us here, you know, I, I'm, I, a little bit of contention is always good. A little bit of controversy is always a nice thing. I think it helps um, increase the passion of people's interest to, to do this research because it generally takes uh, let's say some fortitude to get through this, like the paper that you've released here on, on nature.com is no small article to try to digest. So for anyone that's interested, again, what this is supposed to be is not, hey, the IPCC is a scam, they've been lying to us. It's just there's other data that's saying that what they're presenting to us is not only false, but it's massively um, uh, or, or grotesquely, uh, I guess, misconstrued the data and, and where, we're, where we're likely headed. Um, and regardless of, of which side or not is correct, I think what's here is that, and what the most important part that I think everyone should take away from these conversations is that in the scientific world of debate, we, we should be respectful and not only respectful, but encouraging of, of arguments or debates or data that that disproves what we're saying. And generally, you know, when you're on the side of the masses and people are just almost to a re almost a religious type of degree saying, oh, climate deniers are like lock them up. This is very bad sentiment in our, from what we've seen in our, ha uh, our previous because that's when we started to behead the scientists that were correct and we, shouldn't, we should learn from our mistakes. <laughs> so again, I'm, I'm very grateful for you. I, I love the, um, your childlike uh, enthusiasm for the discovery of your data. It's, it's such a beautiful thing. Um, and that again, I hope, yeah, I hope that, you know, again, that through, through our conversations here, uh, that we can help, you know, do the same type of lighting on fire and spark other people's interest to, to really ask these questions and go, and go against the grain, because that's what scientific, uh, you know, research should be about, is to tr really try to disprove the things that we are uh, very deeply um, invested in.
Yes, we will try to do it. Thank you very much. I like your enthusiasm, fully supportive. And uh, again, we wait a few, five, 10 years and we'll see who is right. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, right around the corner here, Valentina Zarkova. For those, for those of you that like this content, give us a thumbs up. If you dislike this content, leave us a thumbs down if you're interested in these <laughs> conversations. We're going to be leaving uh, the links for as many of Valentina's peer-reviewed papers as we can, because as we said, they go back a few years. Um, also, we will leave the links to the GoFundMe page to any of you who would like to, uh, to leave a contribution. Again, this, this is funded work just out of the enthusiasm to discovering new, new ideas. Um, uh, again, Valentina, thank you so much for sharing your, your time today with us. It's been such a pleasure to, to chat with you. Um, I, 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 well done. Well done. <laughs> thank you. Bye -bye. Um, we'll speak again soon. But hopefully we'll have you back uh, maybe in the next year and we can, I guess, log some of the new data that you guys are discovering and, and we'll, get to, we'll get to see what's taking place right in front of our eyes. Okay. Keep in touch. Yes. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao, bear friend.